Alright, so this is the review for the chapter one test. If you hadn't taken a class from me before, I always construct my reviews so that if you know how to do every problem on the review, you should be able to do every problem on the test. There'll never be a problem on the review, on the test, that isn't just like something on the review, but there could be things on the review that aren't on the test. So the review is usually a little bit longer than the test. There's probably going to be maybe two problems on the review that don't show up on the test, but most every problem on the review will make it on the test, and nothing from the chapter that isn't on the review will make it on the test. So if you can do every problem on the review, you should be absolutely perfect. So I'll just go through and I'll do all the evens and the odds for these. These You don't have to do, well, you can do them with me. As a matter of fact, if as I flash a problem up on the screen, you'd pause the uh, video, do the problem, and then check your answers. That would be a better way to do the review than just watching me do the problems. So the first problem's from section 1.1, and it's not even a calculus part question yet. F of 2 means I need to find 2 on the x-axis, and I need to scan above and below the x-axis to find the point that that has 2 as its x-coordinate, and the answer is going to be the y-coordinate of that point. You'll notice above 2, there's a point with an open circle, an open circle, and a solid circle. You can only have one value, one because to be a function, you could only have one x value for each value of x. This point down here is the point that is a part of the function. These aren't points of the function. And so the point 2, negative 1 is what this is calling out. And the answer to problem 1a is just going to be negative 1. If on the test, you could write, you could write f of 2 equals negative 1, or if you want to, you can just write negative 1. You don't have to write the problem with the answer. For question B of number 1, I find 3 on the x-axis. I look up and down until I find a point that's on the graph, and that's the solid circle point there, the point 3, 2. So my answer to part B is going to be f of 3 equals to 2, and I'd probably just write 2 down for my answer. And lastly, I wrote f of 1, and this is kind of a trick question. I'm not sure we had something exactly like this in, in the homework. I'm, I don't remember this. So I, I go to 1 on the x-axis, and that's almost not fair, but it's not terribly hard. So um, I'll explain it right here as I do it. So I go up and down the line that goes through 1 on the x-axis, and I look for a point that has 1 as its x-coordinate, and I don't have multiple points like I did for 2 and 3. I only have, this is the only point that has 1 as its x-coordinate because it's an open circle. It's not a, actually a point on the graph. So there's no point on the graph that has 1 as its x-coordinate. So the answer here would be it's undefined at x equals 1. 1 is not part of the domain of this function. So when there isn't, a point with a closed circle for a specific value of x, and the function just doesn't exist for that value, and it's undefined for that value of x. All right, that's a, b, and c, but we're not done with problem one because it has some limits. Problems d, e, and f of number one want me to find a left and a right-hand limit, and then a two-sided limit, all related to x equal to negative two. So first thing I'm going to do is find the left-hand limit, and that's going to be tracing along the function until I get right next to the point that has negative 2 for its x-coordinate. can be an open or closed circle when I'm finding a limit. I'm not restricted to only closed circles. And the y-coordinate of this point is going to be the answer. So for my answer for part D of number 1, I, if I want to, I could write the whole problem next to the answer. I could say the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left side of the function f of x equals 1, or I can just say 1. And if I was making um, my key for, uh, if this was a test question, I would just write 1. I wouldn't write the whole problem with the answer. Part E wants to limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right side. So I start tracing 
to the right of negative 2 and make little arrows and stop just before I get to a point that has negative 2 as its x-coordinate. Whether it's an open circle or a closed circle doesn't matter here. The y-coordinate of the point that I'm pointing to is the answer. So my answer for part E, the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right side is going to be positive 1 as well. And then for part F, if the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are the same number, that's the answer to part F, that particular number. And if the left and the right-hand limits were different numbers, then we'd say that limit doesn't exist. In this case for part F, because the left-hand limit, as we approach negative 2 from the left side, we got 1. And as we approach negative 2 from the right side, we got 1. The two-handed limit is 1. So my answer to part F is the limit as x approaches negative 2 is positive 1. How's the GH and I for number 1? So I'll just keep mowing, mowing through this problem and then we'll be done with problem 1. Alright, so G, H, and I involve approaching x equal to 3. G wants me to approach 3 from the left side. So from the left side, I'm gonna, this is the left of 3. I'm going to trace along this part of the graph and I'm going to stop right before I get to that point. The y coordinate of that point is the limit as I approach 3 from the left side. So the answer to 3G is 2. H is the limit as I approach 3 from the right side. So I'm going to trace on the graph that's to the right of x equals 3. Stop right before the point that has 3 as its x-coordinate. And the y-coordinate of it is going to be the right-hand limit. So my answer to part h, the right-hand limit, is the y-coordinate of that point, which is 0. And then for part i, when I don't have a plus or a minus sign, that's the two-sided limit. Because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are different numbers, the two-sided limit doesn't exist. And for my answer, I'm going to write dne for does not exist. You can write the words does not exist if you care to, but DNE is a good enough shorthand. That's the end of number one. There's only 13 problems on the review, and it's only seven minutes into it, so that's amazingly fast for me. Question two wants me to find the limit as x approaches positive infinity. So what I do is, is I, somewhere out here at the far right edge of the x-axis is positive infinity. So I'm going to trace towards positive infinity. If the graph flattens out, the y-coordinate of the dashed line that it flattens out towards is that limit as x goes to infinity. And this line, it looks to me like it has a, a y-coordinate of 1. So my answer for part A, the limit as I approach positive infinity, because the graph flattens out, is going to be 1. For part B, it wants the limit as I go to negative infinity. So I'm going to trace, 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 trace. If the graph flattens out, then it has a limit. And the y-coordinate of the dashed line that it goes to is the limit. And it's, again, it's also positive 1. So my answer to part B, the limit as x approaches negative infinity, which is at the far right, left edge of the x-axis, is also 1. And I'll move on to number three. Three is the same kind of question. Three wants me to find the limit as x goes to infinity. So I'm going to trace, 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 trace to the far edge of the graph. The graph keeps going like this, and it doesn't flatten out. When a graph doesn't flatten out and you're trying to find a limit as x goes to infinity, but it doesn't flatten out, we just say the limit does not exist. So for part A of number three, the limit does not exist. It could happen that a limit to positive infinity doesn't exist, and but the, the corresponding limit to negative infinity does exist, but that's not the case here. And for part b, to find the limit as x approaches negative infinity, I trace on the left-hand side of the graph, and eventually it's going to work its way out all the way to the far left edge of the x-axis. It doesn't stabilize, it keeps going down forever, and when the, the graph doesn't flatten out, we say the limit doesn't exist again. So neither the, left, neither the limit to positive nor negative infinity existed for this one. 
four is doing two-sided limits using algebra. And always, if I'm asked to find a limit using algebra, my first crack is just to take the value of x that I'm asked to find the limit at, and I plug it into the x's in the function. And if I get something that's defined, then that's what the limit is. For 4a, the limit as x approaches 2 of this function is just going to be 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 5 which is 4 minus 6 plus 5. And I think that comes out to 3. For my answer to 4a, I would probably just write the number 3. But if you felt the need, you can say the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3x plus 5 equals 3. They're both completely OK. Part b is a fraction. And when I'm doing the limit as x goes to a number of a fraction, it'd be nice if I don't get 0 in the denominator. If I don't get 0 in the denominator, I'm done, and the number that comes out is the limit. If I get 0 over 0, then I probably have to do some algebra to make the limit pop out. And if I get a number over 0, the limit doesn't exist. So three cases are 0 over 0, then you have to do algebra or something, a number that's not 0 over 0, then the limit doesn't exist. And then as long as, and if the denominator is not a 0, so case 1, 0 over 0, there's algebra, the limit likely exists. A number over 0, the limit doesn't exist, there's no algebra I can do. And a number in the denominator other than 0, this is what the limit is just like kind of similar to 4a. There's no extra algebra to do. Like in 4a, I just plugged the number in and I was done. That would be the case here. So if when, when I plug 2 in, if I don't get 0 in the denominator, then I have my answer. But I think that bad things are going to happen. So when I do part b here of number 4, I'm going to plug in 2 for each of the x's. And once I plug the 2 in, I stop writing the word limit. And here I'm going to get 4 minus 14 plus 10 over 4 plus 8 minus 12, which is 0 over 0. That means the limit likely exists, and I likely have to factor and cancel to get that limit for this problem. So I'm going to continue my algebra down here. and improve upon my work. So I'm going to factor the numerator. The numerator factors into x minus 2 times x minus 5. The denominator factors into x plus 6 times x minus 2. And I should have written a 2 there, not a 0. And then if you factor correctly, the thing that caused the 0 over 0 to happen will cancel out. So I'm going to cancel out the x minus 2's. And I'm going to write the problem as a limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 5 over x plus 6. And I'm going to plug in 2 for my x's. I'm going to get 2 minus 5 over 2 plus 6, which is negative 3 over 8. And that's going to be the answer. That is what the limit is for part b of number 2. So my answer is negative 3 over 8. In part C, I'm going to get a 0 over 0 again, but I'll show you that that happens. Because always when I'm finding a limit at a number, I should plug the number in for x. Because if I don't, in a fraction problem, get 0 over 0, then I have my work done. I don't have any extra algebra to do. Unfortunately, in this problem, the numerator comes out to 0, and the denominator comes out to 0. And when you get 0 over 0, when you're trying to find a limit at a number other than infinity for a fraction, then you usually have to do more work. The work in this kind of problem is to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. So I'm going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the numerator with the sign changed. And when I do that, I might as well put both the numerator and the denominator in a parentheses just to make the work a little bit easier to follow. 
And in these kinds of problems, what we did is we foiled out the numerator, but we don't multiply out the denominator. So on my next step, I'm going to have the limit as x approaches 25, and the denominator is going to stay x minus 25 times the square root of x plus 5. The numerator, I know it's going to come out to x minus 25, but I'll do it for you. For the numerator, I need to FOIL. And when I FOIL the numerator, the first are the square root of x times the square root of x, which is the square root of x squared, which is just x. If I was being slick, I wouldn't do the outers and the inners, but I won't be slick here. The outers are the square root of x times positive 5 and that's positive 5 square root of x. The inners are minus 5 times the square root of x, which is minus 5 square root of x. And the lasts are minus 5 times 5, which are minus 25. And the outers and the inners, when you multiply conjugates, cancel. And when I did the foiling, I should have only done the first and the lasts. And the nice thing about this is the numerator comes out to have just an x minus 25, and that x minus 25 is going to cancel with the x minus 25 in the denominator. When I go to write my next line, I still need to write a fraction because I can't write a fraction without a numerator, and when I cancel out an entire numerator, I would leave a 1 behind in the numerator. And I'm not going to write the parentheses anymore in the denominator, although I could. Now I'm just going to plug 25 in for x, so I've canceled out the reason I got the 0 over 0. I'm going to get 1 over 10 for an answer, because I get 1 over the square root of 25 plus 5, which is 1 over 5 plus 5. So my answer to part c, the limit as x goes to 25 of that function, is 1 tenth. That's the end of number four. Number five is doing limits at infinity of fractions. And what we did, I'll be consistent. So for every limit at infinity for a fraction, what we did is we went through and multiplied every term by one over the highest power of x that occurs anywhere. And in this problem, the highest x power of x that I see is an x squared. And so what I'm going to do is multiply each and every term by 1 over x squared. So I'm going to go 6 over x squared times 1 over x squared minus 2x times 1 over x squared plus 1 times 1 over x squared in the numerator. And then in the denominator, I'm going to go 3x squared times 1 over x squared plus 4x times 1 over x squared minus 5 times 1 over x squared. In the numerator, the x squareds cancel from the first uh, multiplication. Fraction's gone because I've canceled the entire denominator, and I'm left with 6 times 1. So the first thing I'm going to write on my next line in the numerator is what's left over, which is the number 6. For the next multiplication, I'm going to cancel this x with one of the x's from the x squared and be left with an x to the first in the denominator. What I'm going to multiply is this 2 or this minus 2 and this 1 in the numerator and get a minus 2 and leave an x in the denominator. Bring down the plus sign. Nothing to cancel and do this multiplication of 1 times 1 next and the last term in the numerator is going to be 1 over x squared. In the denominator, first canceling, I cancel out the x squareds. Can't fraction's gone. I'm left with 3 times 1, which is 3. Next canceling, this whole x cancels out with one of the two x's from the x squared, leaves me with an x to the first. I multiply the 4 and the 1, leave the x in the denominator, and get a 4 over x. And then last one, I multiply this minus 5 times 1, and I get minus 5 over x squared. Now that I have that done, I can plug in infinity for the x's, and then once I plug the infinity in for the x's, I stop writing the limit 
uh, I have too many minuses here. This should just be 1 minus. should just be 6 minus 2 over x. I just had 1 minus, not 2 minuses there. Sorry about that. So I'm going to go 6 minus 2 over infinity plus 1 over infinity squared divided by 3 plus 4 over infinity minus 5 over infinity squared. And any fraction with a infinity in the denominator and a number that's not infinity in the numerator is equal to 0. So this is going to be 6 minus 0 plus 0 over 3 plus 0 minus 0. The four fractions that have infinity or infinity squares in the denominator are equal to 0. And that's going to give me 6 over 3. And my whole answer is going to be 2. So the limit as x goes to infinity of that function that I was given is just 2, that function there. 5b is another limit at infinity of a fraction. So I'll scan the problem, find the highest power of x that occurs, and multiply everything by 1 over that power of x. And just like in part a, the highest power of x that occurs is x squared. So I'm going to multiply each and every term by 1 over x squared. So in the numerator, I'm going to go 12x times 1 over x squared plus 6 times 1 over x squared. In the denominator, I'm going to go 3x squared times 1 over x squared minus 4x times 1 over x squared plus 2 times 1 over x squared. And I'm going to do my canceling. First part of the numerator, this x cancels the x squared down to an x to the first. I'm left with 12 times 1 over x, which is 12 over x. So I'm going to write the limit as x goes to infinity of 12 over x first. Second one, there's no canceling. I just multiply the 6 and the 1 and get 6 over x squared. And I'll move down to the denominator, cancel out the x squared, which makes the first fraction go away, multiply the 3 times 1 and get 3, cancel this x with one of the two x's, leave an x to the first in the denominator, multiply this and get a minus 4 over x. Last multiplication, nothing cancels, multiply the 2 and the 1 and get plus 2 over x squared. Now that I only have x's in the denominators of the fractions, I can plug infinity in and stop writing the limit. So I'm going to go 12 over infinity plus 6 over infinity squared over 3 minus 4 over infinity plus 2 over infinity squared. All the fractions that have infinity or a power of infinity in the denominator are equal to 0. So the numerator is going to be 0 plus 0. The denominator is going to be 3 minus 0 plus 0. This is going to give me 0 over 3. And that's not undefined. Any fraction with a 0 in the numerator is equal to 0. So my answer to part b of number 5, the limit as x goes to infinity of that fraction is 0. Notice that I'm not doing the graphing that I did as I did the, the homework because I can get the answer without pulling my calculator out. But if you remember the checks that we did as we went through the section, you're more than welcome to use those to confirm your answers. It just makes the videos longer than, than I want them to be. And um, so I'm just trying to get through this exactly how I'd expect you to do it on the test. But all the calculator checking that we did is still a great idea. 6 wants me to look at the graphs and find whether points of discontinuity. So any point where if I'm tracing along the graph, I have to lift up my pencil to draw from one spot to another is a point of discontinuity. And in 6a, the first point of discontinuity is at x equal 10. So the values of x where the graph or the function is not continuous. One of them is x equal to 10. And then if I continue doing the graph, the next region is x equal to 12. So I can draw all this. I have to pick up my pencil at x equal 10 to draw this part of the graph. 
and I have to pick up my pencil at x equal 12 to draw this part of the graph. So for part A, there are two values of x where the graph is discontinuous at 10 and at 12 where the graph have, has breaks. Now I have to say why the um, function isn't continuous there. So part one says the function isn't defined. Well at 10, there's a solid circle, so the function is defined there. So that's not the value. That's not the answer for number one for, for part A. Number two for part A says the limit doesn't exist, and that's the, the thing here. At 10, the left-hand limit is the y-coordinate of that point, and the right-hand limit is the y-coordinate of that point. The limit doesn't exist when the left and the right-hand limits are, this, are different. So the reason the graph is discontinuous at number 10 is reason two, that the limit doesn't exist. The left-hand limit doesn't equal the right-hand limit. At 12, the limit doesn't exist, so it's, all, it's very true because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit don't exist. So reason two is a reason it's discontinuous there. It's also number one because the function isn't defined at the point of discontinuity. If I look through 12, there aren't any closed circles, so it's also reason one. Um, on the test, it says give me every reason. Quite honestly, if you just give me one reason, I'm going to be happy with that. For part B, I can draw this part of the graph, fine. Then I have to lift up my pencil to draw this part of the graph. I only have to lift up my pencil once to draw the, to draw the graph, and that place where I had to lift up my pencil is right here at x equal negative 2. So the value of x where the graph is not continuous, should be not there, U O U S is x equal to negative 2, and if I look above and below the graph at x equal negative 2, the function doesn't, isn't defined there, so it is definitely a reason 1, and the limit doesn't exist because the left-hand limit is some doesn't, it doesn't exist actually, it's infinity. The right hand limit doesn't exist. They don't equal each other because the graph doesn't meet up there. It's also reason two. If this is all you showed for your answer on the test, the point of discontinuity, reason that it didn't exist would be fine. Similarly, if this was your answer for 6a on a test question that had the wording of 6a, that would be completely fine. I guess I could use Roman numerals because I have kind of Roman numerals up there. All right, so 7 gives me a fraction, part A, and asks me where the function is discontinuous. And every fraction is going to be discontinuous at any value of x that makes the denominator 0. And we can buy off on the reason 2 because the gr reason 1, should I say, any value of x that makes a fraction's denominator equal to 0 is the function doesn't exist there. So that gives me a, a freebie to get my answer. So when I'm doing 7a, to find the points of discontinuity, I can just take the denominator, set it equal to 0, factor it, set each of the factors equal to 0. And at both of those values, the graph is going to have a break. Turns out that at x equals negative 1, it's going to have a hole because the factor of x plus 1 in the numerator would cancel if I factored in cancels, and that creates a hole. And at negative 3, I'm going to get an asymptote. But both of these, if I plug negative 1 into the original function, I get a 0 in the denominator, which is undefined. If I plug negative 3 into the original function, I get a 0 in the denominator, which is undefined. So if I was writing my answer for a test, I would just say x equal negative 1, comma, reason 1, and x equal negative 3, reason 1 because that's good enough because the function isn't defined at that point of discontinuity and I'm done with everything I need to do. If I was graphing this, 
like I said, at x equal negative 1, the graph would have a hole. And at x equal negative 3, the graph would have an asymptote. It would probably go something like this. I'm not exactly sure how it looks, but it would do something funky like that. And actually, it's probably not the best graph. It probably would go something like that. But the graph, how the graph looks isn't important. If you're asked to find any points of discontinuity for a fraction, the trick is to take the denominator, set it equal to 0. Any value of x where the denominator equals to 0 is a value of x where the graph has a break. So it's discontinuous there because it's not defined there. For 7b, it's asking me to find a point of discontinuity for a polynomial, and there aren't any. It's continuous everywhere. If I wanted to graph 7b, I'd plot negative 12 on, it's a line, I'd plot negative 12 on the x-axis. The slope is 3, which is 3 over 1. I'd go up 1, 2, 3 over 1, and I'd draw a line. I can draw that entire graph in one fluid motion without having to break it into two or three or more pieces. So because this is not a fraction and it's a polynomial, there's no points of discontinuity. So I could, for my answer, I can say there's no values of x that I need to write. Or if you want to, you can say it's continuous everywhere because there's no points of discontinuity. Or you can say there's no points of discontinuity just as long as you, something like this would be fine. Anything else I did in the videos previously would also be fine, but this is, seems good enough. Either that for an answer, there's no values of x here because it's continuous everywhere, or just say that it's continuous everywhere, and that implies that there's no value of x is where the graph has a break, and I'd have to lift up my pencil to draw. Question 8 wants me to find an average rate of change. An average rate of change is a slope of a line that connects two points. And in number 8, it gave me two x-coordinates, but no y-coordinates. So what I'm going to do is take each x and plug it into the original function to get a y. So I'm going to go f of 1 equals 1 squared minus 2 times 1, which is 1 minus 2, which is negative 1 f of 4 is going to be 4 squared minus 2 times 4, which is 16 minus 8, which is 8. So the beginning part to find the average rate of change, the average rate of change is y2, 8, minus y1, negative 1, over x2, 4, minus x1, 1. This is going to be 9, because that's a double negative. It gives me 8 plus 1 over 3, which is 3. So that's the first part of this. Find the average rate of change. And now I'm going to use my calculator to do the graphing part. I'm going to label these two points, and I'm going to label the vertex. So let me try to sketch a graph. I'm going to borrow my calculator and do a zoom standard. So I'm going to go y equals x squared minus 2x, and then zoom standard. And I'm going to find that vertex. It's a minimum point. It looks like it's the point 1, negative 1. Oh, that's what it is, too. Well, let me do that for sure. I'll go second calc minimum, trace to the left of the vertex, hit enter, trace to the right of the vertex, hit enter, and then get as close as I can to the vertex and hit enter. So I'm going to round that to 1, negative 1. So now I'm only going to graph two points because the vertex is a point that I already had. And my graphs aren't going to be stellar, but they're going to be good enough. So I'm going to more or less copy from my calculator. First point I need to plot is the point 1, negative 1. Second point I need to plot is 4, 8. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So here's the point 4, 8. I'm going to draw a parabola that goes through the point 1, negative 1, and 4, 8. That more or less looks like this picture. It looks close enough to that picture to me. 
and then the average rate of change is the slope of the line that connects these two points. So the slope of this line the average rate of change is 3. So it would be nice to, when I say sketch a graph to model your answer, that means to draw this function, plot these two points, and if it's parabola, also plot the vertex, and then connect the two points that you found with a line. That line will have a slope of 3. Um, if you did it on graph paper, you could actually check to see that the slope is exactly 3. But I... Um, but I um, you know, just freehanded this, so it's not particularly accurate. All right, so number nine. Number nine, each problem has two instructions. First, find the derivative using the definition of the derivative, and then find f prime of three. So for the first 9a, I want to find the derivative. So this, these are poorly numbered. I should say this should be one use a definition of the derivative to find f prime of x and 2 find f prime of 3. Otherwise I have 9aa which seems kind of silly. So for part 1 of this to find the um, derivative I need two points. The first point has an x coordinate of x a y coordinate that's the function itself x squared minus 3x plus 1. Second point has an x coordinate of x plus h and the y-coordinate I need to find. To find that y-coordinate, I'll go x plus h squared minus 3 times x plus h plus 1. I have this memorized already because I did it so many times. x plus h squared is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then I'm going to have a minus 3x minus 3h and plus 1. That's going to be the y-coordinate of my second point. So I'm going to get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h plus 1. So f prime of x, which is the derivative, is it going to equal the limit as h goes to 0 in the numerator y2 minus y1. y2 is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h plus 1. And then I'm supposed to write in a parentheses minus parentheses x squared minus 3x plus 1. But I've been saving a line and writing what happens when you clear that parentheses. When you clear that parentheses, you get a minus x squared. Flip that minus sign to a plus 3x flip that plus sign to a minus 1. So that's y2 minus y1 in the numerator. The denominator I have x2 x plus h minus x1. Done with the hard part. Now I'm going to go f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 and now I'm going to cancel this x squared and that minus x squared cancel. This minus 3x and that plus 3x cancel this plus 1 and that minus 1 cancel and in the denominator the x's cancel. So what I'm left with in the numerator is 2xh plus h squared minus 3h and in the denominator I just have an h. Now I pull out a common factor of an h so I can cancel it. I'm going to get h times 2x plus h minus 3 over h, cancel out the h's, so I get f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h minus 3. Now I can plug 0 in for x, I get 2x plus, for h, plus 0 minus 3, so you get 2x minus 3. So the answer to part 1 of this, part 1 wants me to find the derivative using the definition of the derivative, it's going to be f prime of x equals 2x minus 3. Part 2 just says find f prime of 3. So for part 2, f prime of 3 equals 2 times 3 minus 3, which is 6 minus 3, which is just 3. So for my answers, for part 1, f prime of x 
equals 2x minus 3. And for part 2, f prime of 3 equals to 3. All right, that's the easier version of number 9, because number 10 is the fraction. Or 9b is the fraction, should I say. So for 9b, find the derivative. I need two points. That's the messier version. So for part 1 of 9b, to find the derivative, I need two points. The first point is going to be x comma 7 over x. The second point is going to be x plus h, and then 7 over x plus h. And then f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of y2, which is 7 over x plus h, minus y1, which is 7 over x, divided by x2, which is x plus h, minus x1, which is x. And that's the mess. So in the numerator, I need to get a common denominator. The second fraction, I need to multiply by x plus h over x plus h. The first fraction, I need to multiply by x over x. And when I do that, I hold off on dealing with that minus sign. So I get the limit as h goes to 0. And in the numerator, this fraction is going to have a numerator of 7x. And it has both an x plus h and an x in the denominator. I'm going to write x times x plus h. Second fraction, I'm going to leave this minus that you can barely see anymore. That's between them. And multiply out the numerator. 7 times x is 7x. Seven, 7 times h is plus 7h. And then in the denominator, I have that same x times x plus h. And then in the denominator, the x is canceled and you have an h. Next line, I'm going to write the numerator. better by making it down to one fraction. So I'm going to write both numerators together, and I'm going to get 7x minus 7x minus 7h by distributing the sign through, divided by x times x plus h over h. Almost done. Now I'm going to get f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0, and I get negative 7h over x times x plus h. Instead of writing this divided by h as a fraction, I'm writing it divided by h with a division sign. That allows me to flip that h and make it a multiplication. So I can say f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 7h over x times x plus h times 1 over h, which is going to make the h's cancel. And that's going to give me f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 7 times 1, which is negative 7, over x times x plus h. Now I can plug the 0 in. And when I plug the 0 in, I don't write the limit anymore. I get negative 7 over x times x plus 0, which is negative 7 over x times x, which is negative 7 over x squared. That's the answer to part 1 of 9b. The derivative of 7 over x is negative 7 over x squared. So in for my answer, part 1 f prime of x equals negative 7 over x squared. Part 2 wanted me to just find f prime of 3. And there's really nothing to do but to plug 3 in for this x. That's going to be negative 7 over 3 squared. And that's going to be negative 7 over 9. So the answer to part 2 is f prime of 3 equals negative 7 over 9. And for both of these, if you just wrote the right-hand side and you didn't write the problem next to the answer, that's going to be OK. Um, we have four problems left, I guess. And the video's getting ready to hiccup again. So I'm going to stop the video and put the rest of this in a part two.
So this will be, oh, we're almost done. We're probably two thirds of the way done and I'll put the rest on a part two.